to order the Frontier Regional School Committee meeting at 6.32 on February 9th. Okay, first thing we're going to do is review and approve the minutes of January 12th, 2016. Do I have a motion? Do a motion to approve. Second. Uh, I mean, Bill and Bill. Any changes? Hearing none, all those in favor accepting the meetings, the minutes? Not accepting? Abstains? We're all good? Abstain, Bill? Pete. 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 Correct. Okay. Okay. Oh, I'm not on that case now. Okay, um, moving along to financial statements. Patty? Okay, so you pass those while you yes, it? please, because I didn't get a chance to. <clears throat> Thank you. So tonight, Mr. Hava. That's right. People are getting adjusted. You have 25 warrants totaling 1,689,039 and 9 cents. 1,689,039,09. I'm going to pass that around so you guys can sign that. Um, so while we're waiting for um, Lynn to, uh, Lynn, Cindy to go around, um, this is the month of January. We are still looking good. I do have a concern about our out-of-district tuition for this year. Um, we recently had two students move um, their placements. One was a move-in that came, a, a move-in to one of our towns that came with an out-of-district placement. And we had another student um, through an agency placement um, take them out of our school district. So. Uh, we now are on the hook for that tuition, which is um, probably going to be over $100,000 for the rest of this year. So this one that moved in? One, no, one moved in, mm -hmm. and one was placed through another agency to another placement. One lived in our district and was placed by an agency to an out-of-district placement. You can't assume anything. No, you can't well, assume anything. Well, we're not going to tell no. you. Um, <laughs> so I am concerned, and I'm waiting uh, to get through the heating and plowing season, and hopefully we will have some money there to take care of those items. Did you guys for the uh, out of district placement? Yeah. All right. Are we going to get any circuit breaker money? Y yes, but not till next year. You're welcome. Um, so that is the only thing of concern right now um, on, on the financials for this year. Unless anyone has any questions that I can answer without violating anyone's FERPA laws. <laughs> I don't want to violate any, but I'd like to see if we could make an effort to get these before the meeting so we can actually study. I realize it was printed this afternoon at 212, and you know, I asked before about getting the Blackwood County program and whatever. And it'd be nice to have these types of reports ahead of time so we actually read them again. Mr. Decker, you asked the same thing about the warrants. I made that change for you. Uh, I'm doing, you know, we're doing the best we can with what little we have. I have to look at these and make changes to make sure everything's reported accurately. Didn't get to it till today. I'm working on five budgets. Thank you. Anyone if you else? have any questions, you can email me. I'll be happy to answer them. Anyone else? Okay, moving along. Public comment? The public has <laughs> decreased. Um, Student Advisory Council? I told her we had to remind her today, and she's coming, but I'm not sure if I could have 6.30. So I might be on the hook <laughs> so if, if Caitlin shows up at 7. It is my fault. Okay, she doesn't show up at seven, it's her fault. <laughs> <laughs> All right. 
Moving along. Um, <clears throat> unfinished business. I'll turn this over to the superintendent. Sure. As you know, we've been having ongoing discussions about our concerns <coughs> for the central office. I've invited Bob Lesko um, here. Uh, just to bring people up to date, we have had an air. I'm not going into exact. This is open meeting. Yeah. Um, we have had air quality studies done, and um, we have been in discussion with the town of Waitley for possible rental space of their town offices. There are a lot of things that are still up in the air. That certainly isn't a done deal. They have a commitment right now with the South County Ambulance System. I was informed today that probably no decision will be made until after the April 28th Deerfield Town Meeting. Um, whether or not um, we would have the option of going there if they pulled out. So in the meantime, I've talked, um, and thanks to Phil for getting to me some information, a gentleman by the name of Mike Feeney. He's director of the Massachusetts Public Health Air Quality and Environmental Testing System. They are not a regulatory agency, but they are an agency that comes out and they examine the building, they do additional testing, they speak to the occupants of the building, but where they can really be of use, because I think they're probably going to have results that mirror the study that we've already done, is that they can commit remediation dollars to address the problem financially, um, which I think would be a big help if we had no other option and had to stay. So at this point, I'm going to do two things. Bob has a checklist of things that he is has brought to you that if we do need to remain in the building, um, things that should be addressed. There are also some pictures. I've given a couple of school committee members tours um, of our basement space. And I also want to pass out some architectural drawings of the space if we were to be able to go to Waitley. They would have 3,100 square feet um, that we could utilize. Um, we would have separate entrances. Um, they would give us probably the same financial consideration that they're giving SCEMS, which is 5 to $10 a square foot. Um, they said that we could bond the entire project. Um, and that was the same deal that they were going to offer SCEMS. I would really love to get excited about this because the office space is frankly ideal. Um, it is handicapped accessible. Um, it obviously meets all the codes. However, I understand their obligation to see the South Penn County Ambulance Project through as well. Um, I have investigated a few other sites. There aren't very many in our district that could, could accommodate all of us. I also need to let you know that I have spoken with every principal to see if we had, because that would be the natural, um, inclination to think, could we go into the schools? I have a windowless, heatless locker room in Sunderland, um, a temporary art music room in Conway, um, perhaps half a classroom in Waitley, nothing in Deerfield. Um, and Darius, I don't know if you might have one or two, but. We have one or two classrooms. You could, you could. We would have to split everybody up into such a configuration that it wouldn't make sense. At one point I joked, since I live across the street, I said, well, I'll just go to my house and um, do that. But um, we don't have a, a lot of options for office space. So at this point in time, I'd like to pass it over to Bob. And Bob, you can hand out your um, uh, information sheet regarding costs and recommendations. I don't expect anything to be determined or voted tonight, but I'm trying to give you as much information so that you can um, guide us in what you would like us to continue exploring or go in another direction. Can I just, um, just the, about alternative office space thing, that is one of the things that was loosely talked around at Common Town Meeting afterwards and, and the, is the possibility that the Conway Town offices uh, might be coming? That, that there's a, 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 a it's totally premature. I agree, but but that we should still be in the conversation. I said it all. <laughs> that, yeah, it's it, 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 
we should be in the conversation a little bit that that, that if if the town does decide to redo um, if the town office is in the town hall, if they decide mm -hmm. to redo the town hall, mm -hmm. then the town offices would be vacated. That building is wired for modern whatever. Okay. First, I'm hearing that it's uh, so handicapped uh, accessible. accessible that's there there are drawbacks i agree but uh it's a building that is uh, less likely to there is a building that is less likely to kill its current inhabitants and um, well i would hate to trade a, a 1915 building for it's another it's 18 it's, no, it's 1870. <laughs> okay uh, there might be some drawbacks but anyway thank you for that bill bob probably two walls. pardon probably two walls. it does neither one of them bob what I put together um, is, is not a project or any specific thing. It's not precise. What it is is an attempt to answer some of the, give a lot of background on what's going on there and you know, some of the questions regarding relative cost. Um, I don't have an exact solution in mind myself. I just wanted to get people thinking about the building and how issues there are interrelated, um, you know. Well, I think I'll just kind of go down the list and, and talk about things. One of the first things on the top here is the total square footage in that building. Um, if you look at the entire footprint of the building in the, in the basement and first floor, there's 11,000 square feet. Um, they're using 5,600 square feet um, on the, excuse me, it should, it should be, in the first, on the first floor, they're using about 5,600 square feet. In the basement, um, there's about 3,000 square feet occupied, and then just tons of stuff put everywhere else in there. The comment that I'd like to make about that space is it's way more than I think we would need if we replaced it with efficiently designed office space. Um, the, the storage in the basement is scattered all over the place. Offices are unusually large and, and just, they moved into old classrooms that, that at one time, that's what they were, and now they're offices. So I think those numbers of square footage are, are very high. Um, with that said, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the air quality study. The primary recommendation there, and the primary problem, seems to be related to airborne particulates um, from dust, mold, and soot. There were really no critical hazards that were identified in the study, but the occupants there do continue to experience discomfort. And there's other significant related building issues which remain unresolved. So from there, I just kind of go through the, the pricing that you see here, the stuff toward the top is, is pretty accurate. I had contractors out there who really got some good pricing for that. As you get toward the bottom, I was just taking square foot numbers off, off of uh, building related trade journals and that sort of thing and making up pricing. But I had someone in that does clean. Um, you know, they, they, they're a hazmat group. They, they do cleaning, they would come in there. Um, they would, as they were cleaning the building, they would run negative air equipment that would keep all of the dust in the area that they were cleaning. And they gave me a price for cleaning all of the horizontal surfaces in the basement of dust and <coughs> mold. And that's $4,775. That doesn't include opening up all of the boxes and cleaning inside of them. Um, from my perspective, most of those boxes on the inside are pretty clean, and a lot of stuff is just open. I think it needs to be sorted through and a good percentage of it thrown away. Um, the fellow that did the cleaning talked some about running the negative air machine in the basement, and possibly are even buying one and keeping it running here, which would contain a dust that came in the future into the basement. Because the conversation here is going to lead to the fact that if we spent that $5,000 to clean up the basement, it wouldn't be long, in my opinion, before it was pretty dirty again, because of the 
things. We just did some testing here in the last week or so with the boiler running more, and that boiler just produces a fair amount of soot. And if you can run your finger on most of the surfaces, it's a challenge to walk in the basement and not come out of their building. So just cleaning that building is going to be a very temporary solution because it's going to get dirty in the um, I did put in some prices for purchasing a negative air machine, buying some commercial quality portable air cleaners, uh, a portable dust filter and dehumidifier, some odds and ends of shelving repair, um, cleaning of the old gravity ventilation system and sealing it up. Um, I've got pricing in there for storage rental trailer, which is a place that we can move a lot of the files out of into there. But if we did that, that's a $75 a month charge that's recurring as long as we keep it. And there's some costs for moving and packing things and building shelving to go in the trailer. The next item, replace the boiler heating system, is something that in the not too distant future, we've really got to face if we're going to stay in it. First of all, the, the, the boiler there is old, undependable, and inefficient. But when we even had air quality issues, I was pushing to, to look into replacing it. If we just replace the boiler with another steam boiler, it's not going to cost that amount, but it's not going to be efficient, and we're still going to have a bunch of problems um, with the old piping systems so on and so forth. So I really think, you know, that second project that we're going to stay there in place the boiler is something important that we need to think about. And then the list kind of goes on and, and all things play into the long-term decision as to whether we're going to just clean it up and try to stay there for a short time or utilize that building for a long time. There is some miscellaneous asbestos in that building that ought to be removed. We ought to be providing some fresh air in that building, ventilation. Um, this building doesn't have a fire alarm system. Um, egress to the building is, is poor at best. Accessibility is, is an issue. You come into that building at a mid-level, can't get to any offices on the building without going up or down a flight of stairs. Um, the way the law is written for reasonable accommodation, we're okay until someone makes a major issue of it. But if one of the employees or someone that wanted to utilize the services of that building really <coughs> pushed, we would have a big issue with accessibility. Um, there's electrical issues there, there's plumbing issues. And then the rest of that list is just, you know, once you get to a certain point, you can consider gutting and renovating the building. Um, some of the things that I'm mentioning here, I mentioned already that the square footage of the building is higher than needed, space is used inefficiently. If we just clean up the old boiler, the basement spaces will continue to take dust and soot in them, issues with safety, egress, accessibility. Um, we really, if, if we go much beyond the boiler, we need to start having someone look at that building mm -hmm. from the design, the mechanical, architectural design aspect. I just put three options there. I mean, I, I think if we do the most basic cleaning, that's going to cost us about $12,000 to kind of clean things up, put some air filters in there, and do some of the just basic things that will get somebody in there. Um, to clean, move the files out, and upgrade the heating system would be about $10,000. And then the price just jumps up from there. I would like to talk about some of the pictures that I took. If, if you look at the very first picture, the boiler on the right is our new boiler. The boiler on the left is the old boiler. The, the original boiler to that building was a coal-fired um, furnace that was built right into the building. The building on the right is a 60-year-old uh, steam boiler that is heating the building now. And, and if you look at the, 
the next picture you can see there's a there's a half an inch of soot on top of that. And it's just it doesn't run efficiently, it just doesn't burn cleanly. We're not getting any value at all and it's not dependable. The, that next picture just shows there's piping in that building that the old gravity ventilation system had steam piping in it. There's, there's pipes all over that place that are just something that ought to be dealt with and removed. The next groups of pictures just show you the storage in there. Every, every square foot of that place is chock full of storage <coughs> stuff. Um, you, need, you know, it needs to be really good shelving and it needs to be organized and cleaned up and, and done in a way that figures out good documentation and what is um, That next picture, we, we, we had storage in what used to be the old bathrooms for the school. Um, those tanks up on the ceiling were from, you know, very, very old toilets where the toilets were down at the floor and the tanks were way up in the air. When I first came here five years ago, that room, there was three major leaks in that room. All of the stuff in there was, was soaked. Um, and just more and more pictures of all of the storage here. The next couple of pictures just kind of show some issues with egress and, and, and doors and windows that desperately need some attention. And the last one I kind of put in there on a whim, just talk about safety and egress in that building. I was in a meeting a couple of weeks ago in the parking office and the hardware on one of those doors failed. And it was a group of six of us that were stuck in that room for 20 minutes because somebody tried to hinge it off before to get us out. And Everybody that could have rescued us was in weekend. with us. <laughs> I came back over the holiday weekend with a carpenter who happened to have hardware who fit that door because really kind of buy new hardware to fix that old door it just doesn't work. When they took the pins off, it had been painted shut, so they couldn't even whack it. They eventually had a hammer. <clears throat> but um, so in, I was glad you were there to see that. What, I, what I've provided <laughs> is this. just a background. I'm not pushing for any one of these projects or something. I'm trying to answer some of the questions that you asked last week when I was here give you some background information and make decisions. So I can say, you know, thank you for doing this research. I, it feels like to me that we have the accountability as, as a committee to give you the, our blessing to continue looking for other options. But it also brings up thoughts as we look at these pictures and, you know, uh, even our, our superintendent search. I mean, would we want to show our new superintendent was that one of the, the questions? Storage, you know, Where she's going to be living? Yeah, the storage. And <laughs> what's, like what's happened over the years. Maybe we should have the meat in the middle. Yeah. I mean, yeah, she doesn't run away. In the room with the door shut. Believe it or not, we're an upgrade for our candidates. Yeah. This wow. Is, the, this is an upgrade for our candidates. This is scary. It's, it's an upgrade for our candidates. Okay. Seriously. I just, and I'm not sure, I mean, how long we should debate this. I mean, I really think that's the account. We, we, we need to be accountable to say, go forward and find the space. I mean, this, you can throw a lot of good money at bad space. Bill, in duty. We both say, about put a dress on a pig, but at the end of the day, it's still a pig. Sounds like zero dollars. That's what you got here. Oh, stop. You can do anything you want to that. Would you put a, a hundred thousand or, or more or two or three hundred into that building? Yeah. No. What we need to do is, I know it, I'm not talking about an architect or, or plans or drawings or anything, but I need, I need a sense of what it would cost to turn this, let's just use this one for an example, 3,100 square feet in the white, what it would cost to turn that into usable office space. You know, just, I'd like to know, can you, you know, I know you're not an architect, you mean to do that yeah. yes. to the newer building? Yeah, in the in, in Waiters building. I can I can look at it and try to put some numbers yeah. on. Just it. just to, to send me in the right direction. So because I know I don't want to no, fix the I know Judy. I don't want to fix the oven. Can I ask um, can I, can wait a minute, wait a minute. Oh, okay. Judy, you're good? Patty? I just want you to know that um, when they moved into this building, there was a fund 
um, the central office repair fund, there's currently about $39,000 still sitting in that account that I, I don't know, you guys would have to tell me, Mr. Decker, Mr. Smith, the people who've been here a long time, what are the ramifications of being able to use that money to help us either rehab or move or? That, can I answer that? Sure. I think that money, some of that money was derived from that we had a five, I think it was a five step plan. Five. Mm -hmm. We're gonna do this and this, this this year, that next year, and this, that the following your septic system and this, that, right. and the other thing in order to get it in shape. I think that's probably where that money accrued over time from those five five it, stages. It, it did, and remember this was to go towards the boiler because we knew at some point yeah. we'd have to replace it. <coughs> Judy? So, I'm not gonna disagree about the facility itself and the need to replace it with a livable, sort of humane environment for the people that work in the staff. And thank you, Bob, for researching what it would talk, what it would take to like set up the cubicles and set up the other infrastructure that the administrative offices need. There's another issue, which is you're going to be taking all the stuff that's in the basement with you. The Not all of it. The dust, Not the paperwork, it all has to be handled. And so, what's the? Have, I, I remember talking about it before, four meetings ago. But like, is there some larger plan to address that too? Because it doesn't seem to me like that's something. That's a situation that we want to put the administrative staff in to go through it. Uh, you know, maybe there's like a high level the administrative staff can say, take all those boxes, those can go right to shred. But like, what, and then how do you avoid this going forward? Because whether you stay in a leased space or you come back into some other permanent space, there has to be a plan, you, would, you know, that addresses that bigger storage and data management issue. A, a lot of the records would be stored off site. So you don't want to <clears> iron <throat> or something like that? Well, in theory, it probably would be a storage trailer. Um, so that's what the trailer is? That right would here? be. Yeah. I mean, and I, I think yeah. the numbers I have here of the $5,000 to clean the horizontal surfaces and then some more money for some people to come in and sort through things and money for boxes <clears> and that sort of thing would, would get the material that's in the basement, sort it out, throw away the junk, put it in new clean boxes, build and some junk and store Don't lose sight of the fact that you own that puppy. Okay, so whether you move out or not, you own it. Right. So if there are places that you can use, you know, like office storage. space upstairs for storage, right. then mm -hmm. decent clean building, right. yeah. you still yeah. own it. And then going forward, Judy, what I would like to do, I've been, um, I'm going to be talking with um, Scott Paul, our IT director, and going more towards digital records uh, and saving things on hard drives and PDFing and storing, uh, because some of the stuff we do have to keep like payroll records, even though the IRS says seven years, because we belong to a public uh, retirement system, we have to keep them for much longer in case people want to buy time back, there's confusion with their records, but we could get that all digitally stored, copied and stored, and then we can get rid of those records. It's a, just a matter of retraining people who are used to wanting to pull papers out of a folder. Bob? Question I have is, this 3,100 square feet, is there a heating system in there, wired? The heat is, is in, in the uh, ceiling along with the lights. Um, I did get quotes that the design company that SCEMS used to put in their offices, um, they're a modular unit. The wiring and the uh, IT functions and everything are in the walls, so they come and set it up. The cost that they had were five offices for $45,000. So that was for the design and the setup. That's if we went with the same design company that, that but, they've been but, using. But the, are the suspended ceilings in there now? And air conditioning and heating so that if you put the first class office space in there, uh, <clears throat> would that already be available? Or, or is that, that, that would be part of it, which is why the partitions go up eight feet, so that you maintain the light and the heat. Because it's high, they're high, the ceilings are high. They're very high. All right, well, what I'm just trying to get at is, is the 45,000 would take care of building the number of uh, office suites? It would be five. Have. Five office suites. And the uh, area for the rest of the people. Because there already room. exists um, an incredible conference room um, with smart boards. There already exists a lovely kitchen. There already exists lovely bathrooms. Um, there already exists common space. So it would be a matter of putting in um, a hallway so that we'd have a separate entrance and we would have to get some money for that 
um, and I can work with Bob and Mark Verhensky, or the town manager from Waitley, to get some more hard figures for you. I also just need to let you know that what we've done in the meantime is I have three people who are working off-site on a daily basis. Um, and it, it is more comfortable for them, and they come in only when need to. However, there are people like myself and bookkeeping and Patty who need to be there because that's where all the stuff is. So I have sent everybody who has had a problem with it who can go off-site, off-site. Um, so there's really nobody who's down in the basement much at all. Except when we have to use the bathroom. Except when we have to use the bathroom. Phil and Bob. So I, I think since we talked about this last week, there has been this a sort of a seismic change, and that's what Marty indicated at the beginning of the thing, that there is actually uh, cavalry riding to the rescue. And I don't know if you heard that whole thing. There's a public health agency that's coming that's doing testing um, it, uh, you know, at no cost to us or to our tax, to our local taxpayers that's worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. That includes an epi This is all epidemiological. This is science, whether a given indoor air pollution um, in a given concentration is capable of causing a given disease or, or, or health condition. And the state is loaded with all these epidemiologists and people that, um, if the employees are uh, willing to avail themselves of the, the, the thing in the full degree, they come in, they look at health records, ma maintaining privacy the whole time, and they're able to determine. Uh, and it's a, it's a, the thing is that it's a neutral third party, and you can take their, it's just data that they supply us with. Um, and, the, and, and they come in with, uh, they, they come in, uh, with ability to do remediation and tap into all sorts of different funds. They're, they're there to help us. They will be there on the 25th of, of this month. Do they Bob? do the same thing with underinflated balls? What's that? Can they do the same I thing with underinflated balls? Yeah, right, right. <laughs> right. I mean, I, I, I met you, Bob, we're doing all this stuff and everybody's questions yeah. and everything. You know, if Deerfield, I'm going to pick on Deerfield, didn't put a hamper in our, our uh, ambulance place, you know, maybe we should just talk to Mark and since Deerfield's put us in a bad spot, you know, let's put them in a bad spot and we'll just, you know, tell them we're going to, we'll start, we'll, you know, let's put all our efforts. Well, my know. understanding is that the Waitley Select Board has committed to the South County Ambulance and wants to see it through until the April 28th town vote in Deerfield. Because when we had the special town meeting a couple weeks ago, it was a non-binding referendum. So they told the townspeople through that petition that they wanted to have the ambulance service remain in Deerfield. However, it was not a vote, and it won't be voted on until then. So Waitley really feels they need to at least see that process through. I understand that. I think there's a lot we can do in the meantime. Um, I'm really curious to see what the Department of Public Health they're, they're not, like I said, they're not a regulatory agency. They're not there to shut us down. They're there to help, and they're there to provide us with ideas for funding if we needed to stay there for a little longer. You know, categorize things and prioritize what needs to be done without spending a huge amount of money if, if our goal is to find another space. Well, you know, in the meantime, if we're going to be there, whatever it is, two, three, four months anyway, you know, let's buy some couple hundred dollar air quality. We have one in our bedroom because my wife has severe allergies and stuff and it really helps her a lot. Let's buy one for each your office and Louise's office and Patty's office. Let's just go out and buy them. We have thirty nine thousand dollars. We'll just go out and buy them. I mean, it does take the crap out of the air and it filters it. Mm -hmm. And it shuts off when it's when the filter's clogged. I mean that's you know, we have one at home. So I mean I and these people are going off site because of the air, so let's try to help help mm -hmm. clean the air that doesn't cost a lot of money. If they're, you know, ours was like hundred and something dollars. It doesn't bid. When is the state going to get back to us on the, what they're doing? Well, they're coming on the twenty fifth. Um, I don't have any more details than that. I know they bring um, people who do air quality testing. They bring people in, in health to do assessments or interview anyone who would like to. Um, 
and then they give us a report. They said they'd be happy to come and talk to this committee um, and give us ideas, but I don't know what, what the, how quick the turnaround time is yet. Well, no, no, I, I'm just, let me find out, let me find out how quickly they can turn around the information. Right. Is it April a joint meeting? It is a joint meeting. Um, Bob, my question is these, the page with the doors on it, uh, I did go and take a tour. It does smell terrible. But the door with the exit sign on it, if you stand up there, it's actually a rise. And if you stand up there and look back, you're looking at that boiler. Mm -hmm. So that's really not a viable egress if there's right. a problem with the boiler. Um, and the other one, it, might, it just needs some, it just, it needs to be, it's, it's permanently it. shut right now, right? <laughs> yeah, well, so it, it, it works. It has the disease of Marty's well. office. I'm, I'm never quite sure. Somebody ought to really, but it, it's the same kind of thing. I mean, we can send somebody <coughs> down there to fix it, and a week later it may be broke again. Um, a lot of what happened in that building is there were at least two other, maybe three other exits in that building that were just removed. They're just and bricked over or right. covered so on. So those are out. There was a fire escape in every day in every class. There was. Yes. yes. I know that. School there was a fire escape. Yes. But yeah, I can, I can get back at those doors and have somebody look at them and do some research. Did you go upstairs? Make sure they work. Yeah. Did yeah. you go upstairs? The attic? The attic? The attic? Yeah. Like this, yeah. this way? Yeah. So anyways, that was my concern is that the egress was not there. I mean the front door. But yeah. she probably had so you're not looking for a vote no i'm not looking for a vote i'm just um i guess looking for support and um <laughs> and it does sound like you were authorizing us to at least go out and buy some air filter systems so, um, I, think we actually don't like I comment on the air filter so i think buying some of the bigger you know the the a, a good a good quality solid commercial air filter is going to cost about twelve hundred dollars a piece they'll do two thousand square feet so if you put one of those I mean, if we bought two of them and put them upstairs where people are now that would do a good job the other item that i don't quite know whether we really i, I think no, almost no matter what happens or who says what Getting the basement clean once, you know, cleaning the horizontal vent. That five thousand dollar figure for cleaning the basement. Mm -hmm. No matter what anybody says or what anybody does, we're going to have to do that. And while they're doing that, they'll run a negative air machine in the basement, and they can leave it there for a while. And and that will improve. The and air you're talking about moving the stuff out of there while they clean it into a trailer that has some type of. I've seen trailers before get condensation, and that's the you know things on the trailer are moldy. So the type of trailer we're going to have to be ventilated, so so it doesn't. At least they get it all out, clean it, maybe paint, do whatever we need to do down here to try to. That costs at least amount of money to try to see if we can put the stuff back. You're talking about putting the stuff back in there afterwards, right? Well, possibly at, or, at first. Right. Again, just clean it. Yeah. And. But you have to put the stuff somewhere while you're cleaning, right? Mm -hmm. I you know. I think what, what they're going to do is they're going to move stuff around just enough to dust the box. They're not going to open the box. They're going to clean all the horizontal surfaces, and they're going to clean what mold they can find. And they'll I mean, probably if we're, we're going to move these boxes, I mean, it sounds stupid, but if you contain what's in the box with plastic, some type of plastic bags, and, and you seal them so they're clear, so you can still look at them if you had had to get them, but that way, part of the problem is, is, is the box is absorbing all this mm -hmm. moisture and all the smells and whatever else you want to call it over the time. I mean, I'm just... I, I do agree, <laughs> because if we're going to spend money to clean, we can't just move things around. It, 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 there needs to be some kind of... We need to do it. This, is a, this price is from a, a remediation contractor. He does a lot of asbestos work. <coughs> he, he's very well versed in, in air quality. He will seal off the basement, he will put it under negative air, and he will do the project here very safely. 
we we got we do have money. You know, we do have, it's not like we don't have the money. We have thirty nine thousand dollars. If a part of that thirty five thousand dollars is to clean up, even if it's temporary, I think it's I think it's a benefit that the people are working there. Is that a motion? I, I, we got thirty nine thousand dollars to spend. I mean, it's. I don't think you have to ask our commission to spend it on air quality systems or cleaning the basement because it, it's it's for central office. office. If I don't know what the money is there for. Twelve thousand dollar figure for basic cleaning would come from the money right that we here. currently have. That will go a long way toward a first step to hold this over until this stage and see how that we have the next meeting and we make some more. The only issue I have, the only issue I have with that money, Mr. Halla, is that we also had lights donation money, which we tried to use to put a scoreboard in, and we got all kinds of, you're not supposed to use the money that way, so I just wanted to know if there's any stipulations on how we're supposed to use this money that exists before we do it, and then someone say, you weren't supposed to use the money for that. Well, the money that's there is money that we saved on bids for Correct. different things. So if there's money that we saved, you know, it's either give the town back the money so we save the money or we spend it for the building. It was saved for money that the town's voted to spend on improvements to yes. the central office. Correct. So that qualifies Correct. right there. That's what it was. So so I, think the the I don't think okay. we need a vote, Phil. I would just like to urge everybody not to, to, to take a step back from the precipice and not to do this. This is uh, it, you're you are responding to emotion and not data. You have a state agency, the indoor air quality professional health experts in the state coming that can do any or all of this at no cost to us in two weeks. And you're talking about just paying the bill now when it's it's a, we all care about the people working there. There are found there are friends, there are neighbors. We don't want them to be sickened by their workplace, but we have the, the notion that you can do X, Y, or Z, and it might affect the, the health. The, there's like, yeah. We need to respond to science and data on this. They're coming, the data is coming in two weeks, along with the ability to pay. To, for us to just volunteer to pay money is just whacked. When? Understand that I am the daughter of a woman who was a high school secretary for about 150 years. <laughs> I'm looking at these pictures. We've got two separate problems here, the way I see it. One, the building's falling apart, and thank you very much for this. That's cool. Two, apparently we have a filing system put together by somebody who went to Hoarders University. <laughs> what is this? Who files like this? We have three ring binders on top of filing cabinets that aren't labeled, that are falling over. We've got open boxes of papers. Who does this? It doesn't matter who you bring in. If we've got this mess because no one's bothering to do it, they just throw it down in the basement and shut the door and hope elves take care of it, nothing's going to get better. Somebody who has any kind of sense of organization has got to be down there for 48 hours throw half this crap out. I understand that we need to keep stuff for a considerable length of time, but we don't need to keep it in three ring binders on top of filing cabinets. This is ridiculous. We've got to get our poo in the group here. We, we agree. We agree. And but we did. Green is we not had, Who's no, doing we, it? We had a trailer last year. We got rid of more stuff. I am very concerned when I have people, and I'm talking secretaries, volunteer to go down there they're going down there with rubber gloves it's and masks nasty. it is very I mean, nasty it has to go down there. so and it's really not their job this has been accumulated for decades and but whose job is it then well it's our I mean, job we don't need to hold on to stuff for decades no but you do need somebody who can understand what is actually there to determine what legally we have to keep Agreed. And what legally we don't Who have is to it, keep. And how can we get that person in the basement? So maybe that's where we spend our I don't know who that person is. I will go in the basement and call through. <laughs> but maybe that's where we spend some money. And let me tell you, the people that we sent in. solved if we don't take care of Lynn, the people we sent into the basement came out of the basement with rashes. That's what I said. It's really not their job. Asthmatic. But someone's got to go down there and take care of this, or this problem is going to continue forever. And it's not right that we're having a new superintendent come in to 
Yeah. About your old superintendent. <laughs> I signed the contract before I went into the basement. <laughs> well, that's, that's good to know. Teach you a lesson. Pictures and goes, hey, come work here because this is awesome. But Phil, didn't you say Keith, that? Keith, wait a minute. Keith had the floor, please. Sorry. Who are Let's we going to get to take care of this problem? Who is the person in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts who does this for a living? And how do we get that person That's in the basement as soon as possible? That is because a very good question, and I don't know the answer to that. We've been doing it on our own. For the last two, three years, with the um, with the with the attorney general's guidelines about yes. what we can and cannot talk. How about you go down there with a hand scanner, scan it all? And I realize it would take about a hundred years to do that, but it's got to start somewhere because this is filing from hell. Yes, I agree. I don't think any of us no. understood how bad it was until just recently. But we kind of giggle and go, oh, "Yeah, it's a real mess." Yeah. Who's going to take care of it? Because do this do health it? issue, and they people have are getting sick, and they're getting sick because of, of this. Keith, I'm so sorry. let's take care of this, and then we can take care of that collectively. Who's the person, and how do we? Who do we contact to find out who the person is who needs to be in the basement? What hazmat person do we need to contact for this? Who do we? Who do we call? Keith? Um, I think that maybe Blinders Phil was talking about giving us a lead in that direction of who we could call. But when was the last time documents have been stored down there? Where have we been storing the most recent documents? Like, what's our cutoff point from that stuff that's down there? We did that. We last year, Marty and I went down and we said anything in this area, POs, seven years, everything else. We had a shredding company come and they took out tons of boxes. I think the problem occurred when, when they moved to that building from wherever they were, they just threw everything in there with the intention of, we'll get to it. And now, no one ever got to it. So we did already get rid of everything we could have that was older than seven years. It's gone. Then why are these three ring binders on filing cabinets? Because apparently we need those. In a box, in a plastic box. No, those probably those those Something specific binders could probably be thrown out. Okay, um, and I have to tell you, you know, in defense of everybody in that building, they have thrown out unbelievable amounts of stuff to get it to look as good as it does now. So, and I totally believe that more work is required yes. as soon as possible, so you can get in there. And, and do the work that you need to do. I didn't hear an answer to Keith's question, though. Keith's question was, when are you still going down there to store do do documents actively? Or yes, yes. We, yes, on a daily basis. All our special ed records are there. All our 2015 just went, uh, actually our 2013 went down, and our 14 and 15 and 16 remain upstairs. So what aren't those already in the computer? No. No? That, that part of the problem is that we are not using our system as best we can. These people like paper. I'm trying to get them off the paper. Cut them off the paper. Yes. Could I make a suggestion that we have a group coming in very soon, but we also have some alternatives that we can make that maybe we could start pricing things out, putting, I don't know if we have put bids out so that if the suggestion is that we should take some of these steps, we can do them immediately. And then that group could maybe give us an idea of where we need to go to do this. And I'm sure they, I think that's a great idea because they do this all the time. They've just been recently out in Buckland. Um, they were in Montague. They are in old, crummy buildings, town buildings, and schools all the time. So they know. That's why. So that's I'm, who we call. Yeah, that's who we call. That's this is call. the director for the state of public health. I mean, he's a big way of that's air quality. Tomorrow. And he, Find out what we need to do. he is coming, so he can direct us because you can't willy nilly throw stuff out. Agreed. Uh, and when is he coming? The twenty fifth. The twenty fifth. Two this weeks month. of this month. Excellent. Okay. Right. And then those that stuff can get filed. And then that's he can so tell us when who come back for the does that. Records, they know where it is. Yeah, he can it's tell us who does that stuff. Okay, Excellent. in the. Um, 
our time is getting away from us, yes. so I think we should leave this with that suggestion as I watch her write that down. Yes, I'm going to. Uh, and again, thank you, Bob. And I think we Thanks. need to move on, but I notice our student council Mostly here for student person is here, so um, we don't have to make a motion. Okay. I just have to insert her. So if there okay. is Caitlin, Caitlin Burnett. Well, Miss Caitlin. Hi. Um, all right. So most recently, um, since last time we talked to you, um, we're kind of in between doing things. Um, what we're planning, eventually we're hoping to do another field day in, or at the end of the year, but um, that's still sort of in the preliminary, like, do we want to do this, when do we want to do it? So right now, um, we've really just been sitting down and talking about what the student body as a whole is concerned with. Um, so questions that we've been asked as student council or um, things that we've heard from students um, who might not, uh, or who might be discontented with certain things, um, and so talking about how we might present those um, to administration, what we can do, what we can't do, um, and so really just kind of listening to what students are saying and um, how we can present those ideas and potentially make changes. Anybody got any questions? Um, field day. Field day. What was it last year? What were you, are you aiming to keep it the same or change it? Was it good? Was it, I don't recall. Um, I think we liked how it went last year. Usually we've had this very like strict itinerary of things that we do. Um, and last year we decided to go with something a little more free form. Um, so we weren't like requiring that people participate in certain things. We just like laid out different activities. We had kids go up and play music um, and just give the students like an hour to be outside at the end of the year, socialize, play games if they wanted. Um, and that seemed to work fairly well and I think we had fairly positive feedback. Is that a full day, half day? Is it done? How it was, close to the end of the year is that done? I want to, I think it was actually after the seniors had graduated, mm -hmm. um, and it was just an hour at the end of the day. Oh, all right. Okay. Yeah. Really? Field day, an hour? Field. Come on, guys. <laughs> field hour? It's field hour. Field I think down. you push for at least a half a day with multiple things to do. All right. <laughs> so just a suggestion, but an hour? They should be ashamed of themselves. It should be like yeah, Greece. A rain day, too. I like it. A rain day. <laughs> yeah, you should have a rain day. <laughs> Thank you, Caitlin. Anybody All right. else have any questions or comments? Good. Thanks. Thanks. All right. I'm going to go plan the telephone. Budget. Budget's fine. Have a nice day. Thank you. Do you have a pass out? Did I say? Do you want to uh, introduce this yeah, and then yeah. we can pick up? The proposed 2017 uh, draft budget is coming around. <coughs> Patty will do her magic, explaining it all to you in terms that everybody can understand. And then I'll tell you a little bit after that about where we are as a budget subcommittee, where we are with the timeline, and where we are in the entire process once she goes through her presentation. All right, I was just going to wait for everyone to get a document before I started. Everybody have a document? Stephanie, did you get one? Okay. Okay, <clears throat> so what we have here, I'm going to start with a narrative. Um, so our budget for FY17 is in the amount of $10,394,157. This is an increase in our operating budget from fiscal year 16 of 6.63%. The overall increase to the towns of Frontier Regional School District is 5.84%. The difference is due to a zero increase in regional transportation and the elimination of the debt assessment since the note is paid in full this year. This budget does not contain any new initiatives to the academic or technological programming at Frontier. But due to increasing needs of our student population, there is a request to increase our site services by a 0.4 FTE. 
The estimated cost for this is 30810 and will enable the district to provide the services required. Some of the other changes that are affecting our budget <clears throat> is that we do not have a collective bargaining agreement at this time, but we have $55,036 in step increases. We also need to increase our retirement payouts by $102,040. In fiscal year 16, we have eight retirements to pay, three teachers, one guidance counselor, one psychologist, one instructional assistant, one secretary, as well as the superintendent. We must also fund three retirement payouts from fiscal year 15. Um, the retirees had not given us notice in time to get their payoffs last year. Uh, all of the retiring staff, <clears throat> with the exception of the instructional assistant, will be filled. There's an estimated savings of 63237 in this budget for hiring savings. One of the biggest challenges this year in this budget is the fact that for the first time, our charter and choice sending tuition exceeds our receiving revenue. This adds money to our, our operating budget in two ways. The excess tuition in the amount of 69,788 must be provided for through our operating budget and assessed to the towns. And also the staffing positions which were funded by the school choice revenues need also to be charged to our operating budget in the amount of $126,934. There is a schedule on page four uh, for your review to assist you in understanding this issue and we will review that. One of our other funds, the non-resident tuition revolving account, has also been carrying staff costs in the amount of $38,496, which need to be brought into our operating budget due to a decrease in tuition revenues. Now I do want to make clear that even though we are losing one student, these salaries were being funded through non, the non-resident tuition, but they weren't working in those programs. It was just a money source. So now in order to right size the, the, the staff with the students, we have to take these excess salaries off. Uh, the largest increase to our budget is going to be the um, cost of our health insurance. The projected increase in insurance premiums is 6.8%. Now let me just say this is only the second time in five years that we have experienced increases in our health insurance and the total increase over the five years is still under 10%. So this cost combined with an estimate for unnegotiated salary increases for both the union and non-union and the associated increases in payroll tax adds $276,749 to our budget. The assessment for the Franklin County Retirement System has also increased by $15,354. Our SPED tuitions have a small increase of $2,957 and we are going to decrease our legal fees in the amount of $8,500. At this time, we don't normally, when we are looking at our budgets, um, look at the assessments and how they were affect the towns. But we felt that because of the increase, that it was important that you see them. So that will, those will, will look at the assessment data on pages 17 and 18. So page three of 19 is basically what I just went over. Uh, about the changes to the collective bargaining agreements, the retirements, the increase in uh, psych services. And as you can see, the net change to our budget is an increase of $646,427. Okay, so now if we look at page four of 19, I, I wanna explain a little bit about what is happening. We always have netted our school choice receiving funds and our charter reimbursement against our charter sending and choice sending tuitions. And when we've done that, we've always had excess money. Not a lot, but excess. This year, with the governor's reimbursement being only 51504 which is a decrease of $100,000 from this year, 
and the fact that we are paying $676,248 out for 36 students leaves us upside down for the first time in this account in the amount of $69,788. Marty, did you want to hand yeah. out? Yeah, what I want to hand out, the first sheet, it's a um, two-page stapled, um, so that you can get a sense. This is the outgoing students from our district. And I'll wait until you have it. It's a lot of information, but we can we can walk you through it. This is fascinating information. Take it, honest to God, take the time to look at this. Look at Four Rivers Charter School, look at some of the other charter schools, and look at the cap that Mr. Governor Baker is wanting to lift on charter schools, and look at the impact that charter schools have on us. So let me explain that the reason, when, when a student leaves our district to go to our charter school, currently what's supposed to happen is that for the first year that that child is out in another school, we're supposed to get a reimbursement of 100% for that cost and then 25% for the next five years. What's happened is, very similar to our lack of reimbursement for regional transportation, if the revenues aren't there on the state level, we're not getting the money. So the governor has proposed a different reimbursement strategy and it's based over a three-year period rather than the current five year. Um, and he's wanting to make this more appealing because he really wants to lift the cap on charter schools because it is such a political pressure for the urban schools because they have a waiting list in large cities in Massachusetts to get into the charter schools. They need the numbers, they don't have waiting lists. That's what that order general report right. says. So if you look at these, these two pages, and if you look at the dollar amounts on the first page, this is Frontier Regional and Union 38, sending school choice and charter students. And you look at the left-hand column, it's the towns or the school. And then across the top, you have the individual schools. And then you look at the bottom, and you look at the totals that it is costing each one of those towns to send a student to those districts. And the cost is astronomical. We had asked a question to the state, how do we assess the towns for this? Because some towns, frankly, send more of their students to charter schools than others. And the towns, the state said, you have to go by the regional agreement, which doesn't seem terribly fair, but that's what you have. So of course the towns that send very few students um, are going to want to change the regional agreement. The towns that send a lot of students are going to be just happy with what they have. So it's we still have over 300 students deciding to come into our school district and about 100, a little more than 100 going out. The, the way the revenue stream goes with it, we are still losing dollars. And that's the frustration. The other thing, when we look deeper, because we have 23 students, and I just choose Hatfield because it's the largest receiving school for all of our students in the district. Um, most of the kids that went are going to Smith Academy on the secondary level never came to Frontier. They either exited our district out of sixth grade or they lived in our district and were never enrolled or they were homeschooled and enrolled in another school. Um, because, you know, frankly, we were asking ourselves, if, cho if children are choosing another district, why are they choosing? Let's find out and if there's a way to correct that. But if we're not getting them to begin with, that, that is more of, of a difficulty. So spend some time with this. I'm going to pass out another sheet because the only, to be fair is the um, revenue that is received. 
for Frontier Regional and Union 38. <coughs> and it bears out the facts that Patty was talking about. So this is that year, for those of you who have been on the committee for a while, um, remember that Don Scott said was coming, that there would come a point where the revenues, where the outcome, outgo exceeded the revenue coming in. And this is, this is the point that we have. <coughs> Uh, you want to go back to Bob, you had a question? There was a meeting that was orchestrated by the Teachers Association, MTA, yep. in Amherst last uh, Friday afternoon, which I attended with Trevor. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say, I know Trevor went to that and as well. They are looking to gain an awful lot of political thing by putting emphasis on Stanley Rosenberg legislature and what happens about the fact that the funding is insufficient. Mm -hmm. and, uh, there was a superintendent there. Mm -hmm. He doesn't typically go to MTA meetings, but he was there. Yeah. And some of the people that used to serve on the collaborative board were there also. And uh, I, when I left, I thought there, were, there was actually going to be some grassroots people uh, bringing uh, Senator Rosenberg's phone over the weekend. They were talking about calling from there. Really right. I know that there's a lot of, Bill Deal is representing our superintendent association um, for us and, and there have been, um, you know, a lot of letters written to the editors, a lot of people have gone. I don't know how much political clout we have in Western Mass compared to the pressure that's being put on in Boston. But that doesn't mean that we should stop. So. Um, the charter school lobby spent more than all of the lobbyists last year combined. I know. The, uh, <coughs> this, these, these groups are great. So thank you. The, the thing that I just wanted to alert everybody to, they, like this is just for town meeting for us to bring this stuff up at. And if we don't bring it up, nobody is gonna. But and it needs to be talked about. But to be careful in how you bring this stuff up. This is like kryptonite because, and, and I'll just refer to last night's Conway Town Meeting. We had um, Sue Siegel stood up and it's on TV. And Sue Siegel stood up and gave. You know, a, a nice diatribe against charter schools, and I love me a good diatribe. But the 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 thing about it is that parents can take that really personal. The individual parent that makes an individual decision to send their their kid to a, a charter school really doesn't like being blamed for the woes that the charter schools inflict on public schools. And, and I have never and, been opposed to charter schools, and, but I'm and, opposed and, to the funding formula. But, and so that's like the important thing to like tease out that yes, you know, like we support you as a parent making your own individual choice, but our cumulative <coughs> choices have a cumulative impact, and here it is, and you know, whatever. So that's that can be really tricky. There was a parent that approached me afterwards last night, really upset um, that it's just not their fault. Why are we demonizing them? So a couple of things that we've been doing about the charter uh, tuition that we are charged is that um, it's in part, it's based on our own per pupil spending, total per pupil spending, which includes grant funding. And upon my arrival here, it came to my attention that on the end of the year report, which is what is used to set these charter rates, Frontier Regional was get, getting the full brunt of all the grants that support all five schools. So over a half a million dollars in SPED grants, Title I grants, early childhood grants were being reported on the Frontier per pupil. So that was corrected in FY15. So hopefully when we see our next round of charter, it will come down a bit can't make any promises but just so you know from a financial perspective we are doing what we can to try and get those rates down yes mr mcfarlane i was under the impression that it was the per pupil um, average followed the student so if it's so what accounts for the difference between choice and chart it's two different programs 
school choice is that a parent decides to attend a public school not in the town where they live. If they do that, their town pays the receiving town $5,000. Okay. And if that child has special needs, they also pay a SPED increment. If, you're, if a, a parent chooses a charter school, the charter school tuitions are based on a formula of the sending towns per pupil expenditure plus something else plus a facilities fee. Which the charter is a per pupil spending. Right, not the choice. choice is fine, uh, right, and the choice is something that we will never see change because it's not something that affects the eastern part of the state. So we do not have any legislative power to get that changed. One thing we could probably do, I don't know if we we'll pass it all four times, but we could certainly bring it up, is to amend our district agreement where the school choice and the school charter kids get included in the formula. Uh, presently, I don't think the choice, the choice kids may get included, but the charter kids don't as far as I know. Or is it both that? What do you, and what are you in our they do the October 1 formula as to how we do the costs so that when you do your assessments for this year's budget, it's based upon the October 1 enrollment? Right, I take out the choice kids. So school choice kids in are in our foundation budget, but I don't, I take them out because they don't apply to your to enrollment. Our, to our, to our, because they were never enrolled in front here. No, they're, they're school choice kids. They're, no, just choice, not charter. Take out. I, I remove school choice in because they don't belong to a town. Or you take the school choice in, in off, out. Right? But Correct. when we do the formula, to assess the individual towns, the kids that are going out <coughs> charter of choice from the various towns, we're not getting paid for it to begin with, other than some state funding. Correct. Because what I because I, I think we visited this before. And we and talked about it about five years ago. We talk about it every year. Um, and what I believe the regional agreement language says is um, student native students in the schools. So those would not be in the school. Yeah, and that's what we need to change to get that language what, what, perfected. Well, if you ask me, this entire regional agreement needs to be redone because it's antiquated and does not I serve agree. any purposes. I agree with you. I think we ought to go K-12 and get the whole mess straightened out. But I don't think it's gonna happen in my life. Nope. Well, I would recommend you all think about K-6, though. I really do. Well, I agree with you. But Stanley Rosenberg told us in that room over there one night that they wouldn't approve that five years ago when he came to visit us. Steve Kulik was with us. And he said that they would not approve a case that I remember I was there. And That's I can assure you that the town of Conway is not going to approve it. That's what we were told I last know. night. I know. Well, so, anyway, <clears throat> moving along. Okay. Yeah. But we could have proposed to uh, so, amend the agreement to do that little damage. So going back to the budget, um, below the numbers um, for ink, revenue and expenses, I'm showing you how the fund has worked. So if you look at the FY16, we started the year with 48,240. If we add that to the 48,929 above, which was the net income, we had available for expenditure 97,169. However, when we budgeted the, the salaries last year, we had been hoping to get more money, and so we have budgeted there $155,085 worth of salaries. So we will have a <coughs> shortfall of $57,916. Now we do have money in our circuit breaker fund that can cover that, so that is not an issue. But when we move over to the 17 column, that's the issue because right now that the 69,788, which is the excess tuition, but we also have salaries of the 126,934. Now, let me just say I can only work with the numbers I have, which the which Desi updates in December. Come June, when we do our final accounting, our school choice numbers could go up. Because if any of our new students have 
fed increments, they're not reported in, in, in the December. The only December spent increments are kids who were with us the year before. So the numbers could go up, but I can only work with what I have right now. So after that, you have the detailed budget on pages five of 19 through pages 16 of 19. So let's look at page 17 of 19. And this is how this proposed budget would affect our towns. Looking at the bottom, after where it says combined assessment, with this budget proposal, Conway's assessment would go up $113,253, or 10.22%. Deerfield would go up $360,327, or 10.72%. Sunderland would go up 64,882 or 3.73% and Waitley would go up 28,198 or 3.03%. Page 18 of 19 is the five year rolling calculation. So as you can see, Conway would increase because they dropped off 75 kids and added 82. Deerfield Although they remained unchanged, they dropped 249 and brought in 249. However, Sunderland went down from dropped 145 and only brought in 117. Waitley drops 92 and brings in 60. So that, that, that percentage change gets shifted over to Deerfield and Conway. And then the last page, page 19, is just all the differences in the percentages. So if you look at the fourth block, that is the, uh, the assessment. So you've got Conway going from 1443 to 1501, Deerfield from 4724 to 4823, Sunderland from 2475 to 2416, and Waitley from 1358 down to 12.6. Is there anything else? So you want to jump in now? Or? Yeah. We have uh, had two or three have sessions of uh, work on the budget, and it seems, it seems to change complexion every time we look at it. It certainly changed a little bit from, this, from last time to this time. We intend to look at it again as a budget subcommittee because we're not under any constraints of the timetable according to the region in the yet until March. So we, we will have, I believe in March we have to have our public hearing when we have to vote a tentative budget figure at that point in time. But uh, I don't, by the subcommittee at this point, if I could speak for the other three members, I don't think they feel comfortable yet. And the administration has some suggestions and some ways to uh, reduce the 6.62 to, uh, to uh, a much lower number. And we were just briefed on some of those tonight. I, I believe, Marty and Patty, are gonna go through those with you, but we just got them tonight too. So we haven't had a thoughtful discourse as a, as a subcommittee and we haven't had time to to digest them. So you're going to hear the same right now, the things that we know, and then we're going to be again, and in March we'll be able to hopefully give you some sort of a recommendation on where we want to go with it, but we're not, we're not there yet. So before Patty jumps in, um, just historically remind you that last year we had to cut a number of positions. None of those people have been rehired. Um, it was our goal not to decimate the programs. Um, that we currently have in place. And so there were limited areas that we could really look at uh, for decreasing this budget, knowing that this would not be palpable uh, for the towns. If you're looking at 10 and almost 11% increases, um, you know, this would be hard to swallow. However, we thought it was important to take you through this whole process and for you to see all of the details and to get some of your impressions and bring you a couple of ideas of what we're thinking of for reducing this budget. So. Can I just ask a question, Mike? Mm -hmm. What's our numbers for next year with kids coming up from elementary and well, senior class? Are our numbers staying about the same? Yeah, we're pretty, th I, I don't think we're gonna yeah, jump for another two years. Yeah, next year's class is, 
the size coming in is 132, which we Pretty. lose. We lose about 20 students in the transition year. Yeah. And that's, that's about what we lose. Between 15 and 20 is we you know, go to private um, charter. Not really choice at that point. No. We don't usually choice at that point. But our population in the district is pretty pretty steady. Um, it's slight decreases in four of the schools. Sunderland is the only one that we have seen um, any growth in, but it's not dramatic. I'm talking three, four, five, six kids <coughs> per year. So, okay. Um, all right. So a couple of the things that uh, we haven't talked about <coughs> is that. Um, in this budget, we talked about nothing, no program changes, nothing adding in technology, but we do have an issue with our technology. And that issue is that we need a new student information system. The one that we have is very difficult. It does not talk to um, our cafeteria system. It does not talk to our library system. Um, and according to the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, it's not compliant with their requirements where from beginning I think next year we stop sending DESI information and DESI's coming in and taking information so our vendor says they are compliant DESI says they're not anyways we started a focus group and we need about fifty thousand dollars to get a new student information system the other thing that we did not have in this year's budget was Mrs. Barrett's retirement and even though her buyout for her sick time is small she has accumulated sick days which need to be paid out this year so that would be about twenty thousand dollars so that's seventy thousand if we took the one-time costs of our retirements and even though the increase is 102 the actual cost is 186 uh, 185 490 if we were to make the request to get that money from our free cash, it would leave us $207,503 in our free cash, and it would bring our budget down to 3.7% if we take the retirements and then we go back and find another $100,000 to cut. Knowing that our goal is not to eliminate um, staff, there may be some savings through attrition. Um, acutely aware <clears throat> of the demoralizing factor that cutting teaching positions had on this building last year, as well as in Deerfield Elementary. Um, so that would be our goal: is to maintain staffing positions. Question: You've gone through this extensive report in great detail. Is there any way we can squeeze the 20000 that we need to pay Marty out of this current year's budget? No, not with the, not with the way that the, um, the, the uh, out of district tuition is going. I don't know where we would find it. And we don't have it in uh, any of the revolving? I just told you our revolving yeah. accounts here in the negative. <laughs> the, the, oh, to, and just let me say that the reason we are proposing that the superintendent retirement, uh, well, it's not a retirement, it's, it's, a buy, it's, it's, it's money she's already earned. Um, I don't want to say it's a retirement buyout. It's money that she's owed for her vacation days for what she's earned. Um, and the, and the, the, red, the towns already gave us. Mm -hmm. The other question is, you say that our vendor says our system is fine but the state is demanding a better system? The, the state put out a compliant list. Okay, now is that an unfunded mandate? <laughs> it's that always been an unfunded mandate. That the state auditor will turn around and defend us on? No, because we've been required to have this for about 15, 20 years now. And no, no this did. particular software they want to buy. No, they don't, there's no particular software they want us to buy. They have to be compliant. So all the vendors went out, changed their software to become compliant, and now they're just on a compliant list. So that's just a list of compliant so companies. Right. You're not getting penalized for this, right? No. We well, we we'll 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 hold yeah. on and on. Right. If, if the state tries to come and take our data and they can't get it, they will not be happy. Right. 
Well, that's, that's problem, but no, it's not. Problem. It's it's our problem because if they can't get our information, they can't do our foundation enrollment, which is where we get our money. We have to be able to upload everything at the end of the year um, into the state database, which decides everything that we do. If we can't trying, do that, I, I agree with both of you. I don't like it. But Mr. Modesto? And I do want to say our, our database system doesn't work efficiently. And so, you know, whether or not the state, you know, put suddenly put it on the list, we, you know, collectively, administratively, we want to move away from the system. Right now, we have to hand, hand load. Um, whenever I do grades, I got to shut down one thing. I mean, it is a complete, it's a complete mess because it doesn't talk well with other programs. So we have a nursing program with a data system that doesn't talk to it well. We have a, a cafeteria system with all, you know, free we do lunch and all the other stuff, it doesn't talk to it. it we have a um, special ed system, it doesn't talk to it well. Then we have the grading system, you go to the Edline grading system, it doesn't talk to it well. We have to continue upload, anytime class, someone drops a class, adds a class, it all has to be done kind of manually going in to drop. The cloud service is terrible, um, which we are on now. And so we've been looking at trying to leave this for a while, and now it's kind of been, it's, the perfect storm came, like now the state is even saying, this isn't meeting up, to, meeting up to par. So it's one of those things that, I just wanna say there's a lot more to it than just didn't end up on a list. Mm -hmm. um, it's been a frustrating system. They have not kept up, in my opinion, with the, um, in the opinion of the search committee, that search committee that, what do we call it, what do you call it, research committee that we have together. They haven't kept up with the updates. And then the updates that they are proposing to us, now they want us to pay more. And in the long run, the system, not the long run, the following year, the system that we're going to is actually, I believe, $9,000 less a year in the current system we're in now that we don't like. So it's a transition. Is that number Let me just correct you. We're not going to any system. We're doing an RFP, and we are interviewing several companies. Correct. But the way that these new companies bill us is on a per student charge rather than a fixed fee every year for modules that don't work. So it's an initial it's an initial cash outlay for the information, the training, the implementation, but after that it's a savings. Yeah, uh, Patty, the uh, torture grammar department checking in over here. The, uh, um, the, the, the report says uh, no new initiatives. And then uh, now we're talking about a new student information service, which I think qualifies as a new initiative. It's not a new, it's not a new academic initiative. It's a techno it's a technology. That's, that's Plus a, it's all that's five cool. that's it's all five schools. It's not just Frontier. Uh, the cost you've got a year are what Frontier is gonna pay. Right. And the other towns aren't gonna pay anything individually. Well, no, because they've are their their money sitting in our free cash. <laughs> uh, with the permission Definitely. of the group I would like to let Stephanie, who has her hand raised. If anybody has any Go step. Thank you. <clears throat> In just another comment about the current system we have, we could not see our second semester class load before the sem second semester started unless Darius shut down the first semester. <laughs> Call the company. That's how it works. Yeah, they, they, you can't you see the load at the same time. At the same time. But those are the little things. The All right. So those two suggestions that Patty mentioned, as she said, would bring down our budget to 3.07. Um, I don't know if you still have the figures how it would affect the assessments. Yes, to I the do. Town. So if we were to do that, then Conway's assessment would only increase 6.35 percent, or 70,401. Deerfield would be 6.62% increase, or 222,635. Sunderland's goes down $4,093, and Waitley's goes down 7,774, which is probably a lot more palatable to go to town meetings with and try to sell than a 6.63% increase. So we were looking for direction from the committee um, if this is how you wanted us to put together some more for, firm facts for another meeting. We're going to have any money available at the end of the year to fund our OPEB? Our OPEB, our OPEB 
obligation is seven million dollars, and last year I think you gave us a hundred thousand. So yeah. where are you going to have that? Available? Well, you 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 got two oh five, so you could give another hundred. Yeah, but that doesn't leave us much cushion. Well, rainy day the door. door. Yeah. But it's raining now. Well, we still don't know what the contracts are going to negotiate for. Right. So that's still out there. Um, we haven't gotten through the entire winter yet, obviously. So there may be some additional savings there. So um, I think it's too early to tell if we're going to have enough money at the end of the year about for that. I share your concern. Um, when do we have to have a public meeting? March 8th is our public hearing. Like I, I also need to look at the history of free cash. I think this is the most we've had in free cash in, since I've been here, I think. And the increase that we've had in that account over the last couple of years, um, I think we, I think when I started as principal three years ago, it was around 200. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at Patty, if, if she remember, remembers it or we can look at it. But it's not like we've been saving for... But it's not like we've been saving for 20 years to get to this spot. No. I think with the last few years, we have been very conservative um, I don't here, have and, the, and it's and it showed off in that area. I think the lowest it's been since I've been here was like 119,000. And I think over my 15 years in Frontier and this role, um, 100,000 was always our cutoff point. But we usually had between 100 and 150. The point I'm only making is not like we spent 20 years to earn this and then we're going to blow it all right. in one year. Years, in the last few years, we've been very conservative fiscally so here 50, on estimate numbers. 70,000 for me and D and applied it to reduce the assessments. To have the money that's available in there now to be able to take these rather large expenses <coughs> and not put them in the budget. You could have put them, put them in the budget and then reduce the, bu the budget by the entire block of money, but then you falsely inflate the budget because right. they're not recurring right. expenses. They're not coming back again. Right. The retirement, right. you pay them and they're done. Right. You buy the, you spend the 50000 and you're done. Marty goes and she's gone. That's the end of that. Can I just also say that the, the, the retirement payout needs to be a pro, taken from free cash and appropriated to our FY16 budget. And we can do the same thing with the uh, retirements that even though they aren't payable till July 1st of 2016, we could appropriate, we could accrue and appropriate them and add to our budget this year. That's legal to do. And then the 50,000, as soon as that's appropriated, we can put our RFP out on the street. So I know some of this can wait, but other things can't wait because if we're gonna do that, I need to amend the budget with the state and have that accepted. What? That was what I asked earlier. Pay for some of these this year. You haven't spent an awful lot of money on fuel oil yet. If you take the money out of free cash and appropriate it to the FY16 budget, yeah. then we can get moving on some of these things. And anything that we don't use, Bob, will go back into free cash at the end of FY16. Judy? My question actually is about the teacher contract negotiations that haven't started yet. And what do we bump up against? Because if you're talking about having a March 8th public hearing, you're still dealing with tentative numbers. We haven't even had one meeting yet. Correct. Okay. So. Well, we'll have one. March 3rd is our first one. But oh, yeah. Okay. But I do hope to have the uh, elementary contract settled um, by then. We have been in negotiations with elementary since October. Okay, we went into the trouble with the timeline of the regional agreement, you know, right up against negotiations. Is there certain benchmark places that dates that have to be reached to try to the regional agreement and negotiations notwithstanding right. they still have to move forward or you'd be in violation of the regional agreement which is nobody would dare for your license to do that so, right robert okay. so we don't have to vote okay anybody got any other questions or comments bob i would uh, like to see come up with some draft or to take care of the portion of the cost of the school choice and the school charter, if, if we can, to apportion those costs to the four towns, and, you know, just like the regular students get portioned up, and uh, you know, come up with the language, you know, the, the October one formula, and change. You want me to change the regional agreement? I want to propose that would the board vote a change, not tonight, 
but to draft it, propose a change so we can bring it into the 21st century but because of the fact that that was written in 1957. There was no choice and there was no right. charter. So, Mr. Decker, I, I agree with that, but I think at this point, um, and not something I want to put on this superintendent's plate, but I think when we get our new superintendent that we need to put a regional agreement committee together to look at the entire document because it does not address capital. It needs to start addressing OPEB and how we're going to allocate that. And I think if we're going to go through the headaches of trying to get one, chart, one regional agreement change, we might as well focus our efforts and after we're done with our policies, then have a committee to look at the entire regional agreement. But just kick you can part of it you should do part of it that's fine we don't have to do it tonight but I'm just saying that it's, it's a four out of four town vote yeah. you guys, you guys aren't going to vote for it take wow. it Deerfield, Deerfield and Conway will not vote for it Sunderland and and, and Waitley will <laughs> okay moving along um superintendent <clears throat> Yes, there was an error. This is um, under uh, discussion items in the transportation um, budget vote last year. It was a clerical error, so we need to correct that. It was brought to our attention by our auditors. My question was a right figure voted to town meeting. What town meeting, Bob? All the four towns. Yes. Because they they took their vote before. This was your meeting, uh, Tuesday, May twelfth, and I have the meeting right here. And it was in response to the vote, vote to to the votes that the towns took. And Judy Pierce. Oh, I read the <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. The committee discussed the results of the town meetings in regard to the budget. Judy P. Actually, it's Judy Peace. Judy Peace moved to adopt the final operating budget. I'm throwing everyone now, Bill. Um, of 974-7730, transportation budget of 103-349. The 103-349 would have been the net number after the regional um, transportation, but we need to vote the gross number because that's what we're expending. So the number should be 288-106. Second. Any discussion? I think you guys should let me move it. Any know. discussion? I think we should uh, you know, check the spelling of your name. Well, you're going to change your name. Billy second. I know. All those in favor? Yes. All right. Auditor of Earth, his or her salary on that one. Good catch. I tried to make him say it was just a typo, but they wouldn't go for it. <laughs> I wasn't here, so they weren't accepting it. <laughs> I was looking to see if I could pull it up on TV to see what happened, but I wasn't able to. So we got one more. Yeah, one more vote to transfer the FY15 excess regional transportation in the amount of $46,624 to the regional transportation revolving fund. How is this extra money? Yes. So yeah. back in September, we had established the regional uh, transportation revolving account, and it, I misunderstood. I thought once we took the legislation, the money just goes in there and stays in there. But according to Desi, each year we have to vote the excess, of, and we didn't do that. So we have to take the vote to put the excess of forty-six thousand six twenty-four. Second. Discussion. Vote. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. Without dissension. Okay, uh, reports. Anything from the collaborative? Yeah. Collaborative. <coughs> yeah. Um, since I wasn't here the last time, to give a report, I decided to write it all down because there's a whole lot of end of the year kind of summary stuff that we've been going through at the collaborative. So I kind of hit the highlights for you all because there's just a lot of information. Um, just a lot of great stuff going on and lots of varied stuff, as you'll see. The bottom page is the letter. They've also been working really hard at the collaborative past. 
and um, <laughs> not nice to throw things. Um, working with the superintendents, working with members of the collaborative um, neighboring towns, talking about school choice and um, charter schools. And the superintendents drafted a letter. I didn't include all the names on it because I was going to take another sheet of paper. Um, so, Marty, I'm sorry, your name's been a lot better. Okay, I signed it. <laughs> um, but it's this letter that they wrote to open discussion about charter schools. So I included that for you. I thought it was particularly well written. Lots of good stuff. And um, anytime you want more information, I've got a lot of it here. Sounds like you have fun. It's been really good. It really has. Um, the last meeting that I went to, there was a superintendent uh, dinner first, and so was listening to other superintendents, and I think just, because I teach in Westfield, and I'm on the school committee here, I'm seeing the same problems everywhere. And when I was talking to different superintendents, I'm like, well, how about this? Well, yeah, about this, and then other people are like, yeah, we're having the same problem here, we're having the same problem here, and these are the concerns here, here, and here. And it's the same issues going on in my um, So I, I guess I feel a little better at the end of the day that we're not in it by ourselves. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, so. We're all in the, yeah. all in the same. Um, no, not yet. Yeah. Thanks for doing this. For <clears throat> a particular deal for the incoming superintendent, they praise the collaborative superintendent to praise the collaborative for their superintendent mentoring program. So maybe something for the game superintendent to take advantage of when you wish to get to. Thank you. Okay. Um, principal. Um, honestly, the, the majority of my last few weeks has been superintendent search and budget. So, but I just threw in a few small things that are happening in the school. Um, I did comp a coffee conversation with the principal last week in an effort to make sure that as I explained to the parents that were there, to really understand the programs at Frontier, if they're making thoughts about leaving. And I was that kind of blunt about it. Um, and also to learn more about the school while it's open. And I mean, it was just an amazing, I was charged up when it was done. It, it was such, to go through the building with people and show it off when it's in action is a whole different thing than, um, than at night. And so we do have a parent night coming up on uh, March 15th. And I think I'm going to do a sign up again for parents to come and visit during the day uh, because it's just to see, to talk about a music program, yeah, our music program is great. To talk about our art program, yeah, it's great. And you know, if you want your child to go to art school, we have a portfolio program. And we, and until they walk in the room and they actually see the stuff happening, we walk into the you know the band while the band was playing. We walk in the strings while the string is playing. You can say, you know, you're seeing it. This is the program. You know, it's not. Um, just, you know, as I talk to people about us being a sports school and us, you know, you know, having emphasis there, well, you know, I talked a little bit about that with parents um, and saying, well, we have a lot of good athletes because you send us a lot of good athletes, um, but we also have a lot of other programs that don't have a section of the paper deck dedicated to them, um, at least not weekly. So, you know, we talked a little bit about that, but really seeing the building in action, I think, and I asked them to go and tell other people about that. That's why trying to combat any people deciding to go elsewhere, and especially deciding to go elsewhere without proper information. Because I'm not sure what some of these other schools um, are offering compared to what we do. And you have to think about it, look at the numbers wise, that they get four choice students to agree that we have a we, we have built a great program here for every student who chooses charter school. So they go out and find steal from the same pool from other towns and say, look at come look at our program and they're making a decision to come here because they see the great thing we built, but I need four of them for everyone that goes to charity. Right? So it's just kind of, it's like they want to stomp my feet and say it's unfair. And I can't even imagine being a school, you know, north of us that are struggling with numbers of choice being far greater out. I mean, we're in a position where three to one in. I mean, there are schools above us that, you know, in North, you know, Franklin that are, you know, three to one out, you know, and so um, just say, that was my little charter, stamp my feet and cry. Um, eighth grade. I just like to, uh, just like to congrat. I've heard two separate uh, comments about your coffee thing, and they parents were just really impressed. 
And the value of exposing parents to you, to Louise Law, that was the one that Louise Law was at? Was that giving, uh, giving group tours? Is, what, we gave group tours, Louise Law was involved. Oh, that's what I heard. So somebody it was Sarah that? Mitchell. Sarah, okay, okay so somebody yeah. called her the wrong. And, but, and but, or Shelly Miss Allen. All right, but, but, so people were, the parents were really impressed with that. And, um, because they hadn't been exposed to you before, and it's a good thing. So, uh, you did good. Well done. Yeah. Thank you. It was, it was good. And, and, it, and I had the one in the spring. If anybody hasn't been in the building during the school day, um, you know, please come to it. It's, it's good. It's powerful to see, like, what the, we walked in the classrooms as they were going in, and we asked the teacher what they were doing, and you know, they saw, you know, you know, they walked into Dave Buckley's class and they saw them writing a business letter. You know, and they had the letter projected on the board and what they were working on and the kids were pointing out the different areas. Was, I, was, I was excited when I left and then I went to a budget meeting with Marty and <laughs> she ruined it whole, my whole day. He <laughs> yeah. came in, he was just, you know, <laughs> and he left story. dejected. <laughs> Sorry, 8th grade goes to Washington, D.C. Um, the Monday at the break, so we wish them a safe trip. Our Model UN Club um, this past weekend went to um, BU conference and the, we had an award winner, which is a Apparently they had about 80 awards, but uh, 1,400 students involved in it. Um, Liam Kosky won an award for his, his participation there, and apparently just, they just had a wonderful time. It's a great club. Um, and then we have an AP information night, March 3rd, in our Frontier Library here to talk. We did this last year, and the teachers you know, come in and they talk about their AP programs and meet with parents to talk about the demands of AP and what their course content is. and um, you know, all that kind of thing. So parents can have an idea of planning AP courses and which one would be best for parents and children. What is best for them? So that's kind of an overview. What's coming and going? Thank you. Anyone have any questions or other comments? <coughs> had a first year on Molly UN to go on the trip. Raving the whole time. Just had the best time ever. Loved everything about it. It's a great opportunity for kids. So maybe didn't think that, that was something they'd be interested in. Gave it a try really supportive group so agree maybe we don't want to advertise that too much though because if it, there's people that are attracted to it for the fun part of it and yeah. i like the i like that the, the, the kids that are attracted to both the fun and the academic the, 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 it, yeah. but but the more fun that we talk about the more like the people that just want to go and have fun yeah, exactly and lastly superintendent sure um most of it i've already talked about so it'll be a very short report. Um, if it's making the way here, its way around, I spent the latter part of my report talking about the charter, and so now I probably said all sorts of things. I apologize if any of your papers are dirty. All of my papers <laughs> fell in the parking lot. I was going out to my car, so some are in better states than others. Um, so I did want to bring to your attention, because it was in the news, the number of bomb threats that were made during the month of January um, in Massachusetts and elsewhere. Uh, 34 bomb threats were received by January 26th in state, and over 100 uh, school bomb threats were received along the East Coast, New Jersey, New York, and Maryland. 25 of the threats in state were sent via robocalls, and the remaining threats were received via email. None of the threats were real. Um, and But it caused quite a stir and, and discomfort and inconvenience for those schools that decided they needed to evacuate and, it's, and some of them sent students home. How lazy um, of a bomb threader can you be to do a robocall? Well, I know. And actually, I heard <laughs> recently that they, they are prosecuting. We found somebody in the eastern part of the state and they are prosecuting them. And I, I frankly hope they make quite an example of it because it was extremely disruptive. Um, we've been following the guidelines of the Massachusetts State Police, and um, which is the guidelines that we've had with our four town safety meetings. We've talked on a regular basis with our local police or state police. So um, I asked principals to review protocols with the school secretaries and um, not on wood, it's been quiet for a couple of weeks. Did you want to add? No, I was just going to say that um, these students don't realize how serious these things are. In a previous district, we had one, and um, I was working with the police. When these, if these students are convicted of this, they go on a no-fly list for the rest of their lives. So 
they really need to think about what they're doing if they if they call in a bomb threat because they'll never be able to get on an airplane for the rest of their lives. Even if minors, it doesn't go into their minor. It doesn't it no. seems like a minor. No. no, in fact, you know, because, because there were so many that were made and it was such a disruption. Um, most of them occurred in the eastern and central part of the state. I think there was one in the left. That's Other than in Holyoke. Um, so they probably are going to make much more of an example of them than they might normally. And as I mentioned earlier, we are beginning, we have a meet and greet. If you haven't gotten a notice, if you're on the committee, uh, it will be coming soon on March 3rd for our first uh, Frontier contract negotiations. I hope to have um, I said the elementary one's done. And the rest is about the charter and choice. The final paragraph there, um, I just wanted to bring to your attention, because I don't know that I had said that, because the state has not had the money to fully fund the reimbursement formula for the last two years, the state has paid part for the first year reimbursement and none after that for the finals. So, um, you know, I, I think we all would love to have our household budgets that way. Oh, well, I just, you know, I own the money. I just won't pay the light bill this month. So um, it is frustrating. So that's what I have. One of the things that just came out the other day, is that the charter school has surplus revenue. And they are supposed to be reimbursed the cities and towns from where the students came if they have surplus revenues. Where would the surplus come exceptions. from? Their $200,000 salaries? But there's some exceptions to the rule that if they've got major projects going, they skate. But one of the things that they were talking about was investigating all these charges for the cities. A lot of their money is making sure that they have a surplus money revenue. Thank you. Okay, we're moving to adjourn. I just had a motion and a second. Yeah. All those in favor of? Yes. Aye. Aye.